Hi, everyone, and welcome to Berkeley's Stylistic Diversity Series. Um, we're here with Berkeley's Chair and Assistant Chair of the Guitar Department, Kim Perlack and Cheryl Bailey. And we've got some incredible faculty that will share some insights with you here today. So to kick it off, Kim. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the Chair of the Guitar Department. and um, you all may have heard us a little bit on our podcast that we do weekly on Apple Podcasts and Spotify called Berkeley Guitar Department Coffee Talk. And this is like a big coffee talk. Um, we thought instead of having one person with us, we'd have a couple people who you might not stylistically associate with each other. But at Berkeley in the guitar department, that's exactly what we want you to do. We want you to come and dive really deeply into the style that you choose and then have the courage to branch out and bring other things into your playing. And so to that end, we have Cheryl Bailey with us, uh, as Damien said, our assistant chair. Hey, Cheryl. Hey, everybody. And we've got Ian Steed, our senior coordinator as usual. Hey, Ian. Hey, everybody. Good to be here. <laughs> and our faculty members that represent Stylistic Diversity today are David Tronzo, our professor. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. And Berta Rojas, our associate professor. Hi, Berta. Hi, everybody. Yeah. So if you are not familiar yet with Berta and David's playing, you should go right out and do that. And to help you, we're going to put some videos of them on YouTube on our playlists. And um, Ian can share some links there. Um, but easily, you just go to YouTube and you go to Berkeley Guitar Department and you'll find them. Um, David is a modern improviser and a master of the slide guitar. He's known for being an innovator in that style and bringing the slide guitar into every style, the styles that you associate with it and the styles that you don't, and playing solo guitar. And then recently he and I are in a duo and we teach some classes together here at Berkeley in addition to the things that he teaches about studio skills, uh, music for film scoring, and then um, modern improvisation, um, which is spontaneous composition that he'll talk about, and modern writing skills. And um, Berta Rojas is a virtuoso classical guitarist. She is recently uh, on the full-time faculty here with us. Congratulations, Berta. And um, both of them have in common that they had remarkably long concert careers that were their main source of income, which we know is what a lot of what you want to do. You want to tour the world and you want to play for a living and both of them have done that. And you may listen to them and think that they are the most different guitarists that you've ever heard. But in reality, what they have in common is they've brought a lot of stylistic things together in their interpretive and uh, spontaneous composed playing. They have worked very deeply on tone production and self-awareness to find their own personal sound that you can recognize in a moment. They really have a grasp on their fundamental skills that are related to those things. And, uh, and they've had that experience of having a performance career and now transitioning into being based here at Berkeley as professors and master teachers. And so we thought they'd be great to talk about those things and give you a sense of what you might be looking at at Berkeley as a student earlier in your path if you want to end up kind of where they are. So um, to start, um, let's start with some playing stuff. Let's start with fundamental skills. And I think what I'd like to know from each of you, maybe David, you could start, is um, what are some of the fundamental skills that you think that students should be working on when they come to Berkeley and maybe when they're preparing to come to Berkeley that have really helped you as you play in a lot of different styles and also developed a unique sound on your instrument? And you want this answer short, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking like we're going to try to do the one to two minute version and we can oh. go back and forth, but just okay. like a few things that you think, maybe some of the things as Ian would say that you won't, that you don't think about, some of the things you take for granted in, in this answer. Okay. Well, I, I first need to say that um, I started exclusively pursuing what I do now. Like I had this idea as a kid that I was gonna take slide guitar and I was gonna develop, develop it into something way bigger, that it could go into all this other music, jazz and improvised music and classical music of various kinds. <clears throat> and I just, I, I just embarked on that. I didn't copy, I didn't study. I just went, I started to work myself. And very quickly, I found out that 
even though that's a wonderful idea and it proved to be very, very fruitful and successful, I still needed all the fundamental things that every guitarist and every musician needs. And that list would be, <clears throat> in terms of data or information, it would include all the modes of all the scales, starting with major scales, and you can live in major scales for a long time. There's a lot of music that uses major scales and their derivatives. Triad chords, close and spread, you know, just triads on the fretboard, movable. Triad arpeggios. And you could, in my opinion, stop there for a while and build a lot of things because even triads, you can look at seventh chords, like they're combinations of triads. But if you added seventh chord voicings in, you'd be well on your way. Later, I got into dyads. I broke things down backwards and I got into dyadic uh, playing, which gave me way more freedom. But that was also a demand that my, my playing effort had immediately because it's largely a linear thing with very small harmonic sounds. But I needed all that stuff. And I needed an awareness eventually, you know, as quickly as I could of what I call the super fundamentals, which includes the parameters of music sound, you know, things like duration, understanding, register, what does it mean? Do you play things in every register? You know, can you play all ideas in every registers? Uh, uh, you know, densities, velocities, timbre, envelope of a note. A lot of guitar players, we don't think about how a note starts, what happens while you hold it, how is it decaying, how do you release it. And I played with horn players all the time, and they're always thinking about this stuff. They're always thinking about their sound. Um, Wayne Shorter said once in an interview, tone is the highest order of technique. Right? So I was picking up on these things early. And uh, the data itself, I would execute it often without thought about those parameters. So when I added my, gradually started to add my awareness into that, I began to play really musically. Now, because I was doing this largely out of sight of a teacher, no one stopped me and said, you're not making that sound very good. I had to go out in the world and figure that out kind of backwards. It's largely been a sort of backwards thing. As a matter of fact, my Friends laughed when I was hired at Berkeley in 2003. They said, finally, he's going to school. <laughs> and I'll stop there. <laughs> I love that. I love that because I think it really also shows a little bit how far the guitar department has come. And Damien and Cheryl have been here the longest of all of us here. And um, Larry Bayonne, who is my predecessor, he, um, he said a, a lot of times when he was looking for faculty to make up our modern faculty, he would say to people, come and teach what we didn't have for you when you were a student. So I think what's great now is that um, you're able to come and create this body of work and a study for people that didn't exist when you were their age. And so I think that's really cool. Yeah, that's great. Berto, what about you? Because I think that the tone production elements that David talked about are the same. When when you are thinking about fundamental skills for a classical guitarist, tone production has to be one of those things. And then could you talk about a couple of other things that you think are important? I'm, I was listening very carefully to everything that David was saying, and I was thinking of how privileged we are. Uh, in this environment in which we can interact with uh, players of David Caliber and Cheryl and Kim and, and Ian and get nurtured by their insight in music, you know. And at the same time, bring all the things that uh, uh, are things that we worked a lot on as classical players. You know? We just uh, had a repertoire class just minutes before. Uh, coming to this webinar and I was listening to some of my of the students there from stylistically diverse uh, environments you know they are coming from and how is it that we try to integrate the classical view into a Ted Atkins arrangement uh, that one of our students was playing you know? and we were talking about tone we we're talking about dynamics we we're talking about rubato we're talking about articulation. We we're talking uh, about all the things that are part of the palette of a classical player, no? the, the 
interpre interpretive and interpreter paler, right? Uh, I'm not getting that that word right, Kim, in English. So help me there. Uh, but that's that's the idea, no? You have like a palette of elements or resources that you can use, and it doesn't matter what style you are playing. You can always use them, right? Like articulation will be uh, a, a good uh, element to use in every style you play. Dynamics, why not? You know, uh, rubato, why not? You know, uh, even when you are playing to a drum, right? You can you can still do a little bit of that, right? Uh, so those are the things that that uh, concerns me as a player, and uh, more than anything, I, I think is the honesty to your music, you know, uh, and to be true to yourself. What is it that you bring to to music, right? What is it that you bring to to the guitar? What is it that makes you happy and that brings a smile? when you are about to pick up the instrument and play, you know? Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Here at Berkeley, we just want everybody to be happy with whatever makes you happy. You know? uh, and we are here just to accompany your creative growth, uh, your, your creative search. And the same questions that we ask ourselves is, are the questions that uh, we're gonna ask you as students. Huh? I, th I love that answer and I want to build on it a little bit because I think that what we hear students say a lot and what you two have achieved is you've achieved a personal sound that you're very distinctive players on any record or any anything we can tell it's Berta we can tell it's David and yet to do that you had to really embrace some things that were very hard that maybe didn't always make you happy, this kind of deep work in the fundamentals. And I think sometimes there's a misconception with younger players where you think, I just wanna be free to be expressive and be myself. And in order to do that, we know you have to go pretty deeply through these fundamental skills with your technique and your materials that you're working on and, and the way that you incorporate all of these things so they become instinctive and they become part of what you, what you do. And, I wonder if each of you could spend a little time talking about how you did that for yourself and or maybe if you want to answer it this way, how you help students do that for themselves. Um, David, do you want to start? Wow, that is that's a, that's a, a complicated question. So in a way. Um, I mean, I, I can only say a little bit what I did which was I devoted um, hours a day uh, working with really small amounts of something and really working with it like by focusing and really kind of going deep. And when I mean small, I mean sometimes the movement between two notes or something really, you know, I would build these building blocks. Now, <clears throat> a lot of what I would, if I had time to describe here, frankly speaking, the students at Berkeley don't have that amount of time. I'm talking about, you know, all day. And sometimes this is in the presence with other musicians. We used to get together and work on things, you know, one group for six hours, I would go to somewhere else and do that. And I would go to a gig or <clears throat> we practice together guitarists. Sometimes I'm working with other instruments, obviously, and you're tuning your ear to all those things about articulation and playing, you come back and you say, wow, I need to, I need to bring that out more. I need to develop that. And, and it's all about slowing down and going deeper. So at Berkeley, I try to introduce for students a version of that that is sustainable in the time that they actually have per day, right? So we just try to think about that at this stage, while you're in school, you're, you're collecting a lot of things. So it's, it's, for me, it's, I try to encourage them not to think in terms of how much time they're putting at something, but how well they're focused on what they're doing. And the last thing I'll say, you know, to keep it brief is that we're never practicing one thing at a time. We're actually practicing probably upwards of 10 things at the same time, breathing, your various techniques, your relaxation, your focus, your time, your rhythm choices, your articulation, all those things, you break it down, it's 
a lot of things, but to become aware of that list is not overwhelming. At first, maybe it looks overwhelming, but it isn't because if you, if I'm playing and I am struggling with something, I can sort of check the list and say, why is that not working as well as I'd like it? And maybe it's a physical thing I've changed in my hands. Maybe I've held my breath. You know, maybe I changed how I'm sitting or standing and my posture is kind of creating stress or whatever. And the list can go on and on and on. So one of the things I help with students is as they play for me, I can point those out to them as we well know. Uh, I can hear through their sound when they're holding their breath. Uh, before getting to Berkeley, when I would teach privately, my best teaching tool was a long handled mirror, like a beauty mirror. Because while someone was playing, I would just slide it under their chin and there'd be nothing on the mirror. And they would look down and they'd go like, as like, yeah, you're not breathing. You know what your body is doing right now? It's trying to figure out if you're in crisis. It's not thinking about this arpeggio you're trying to play. It's wondering if you're in danger. You know, your brain just switched gears. And they're like, wow, I didn't know that. Now they know that, right? So they, they work. Anyways, um, small things. Uh, in Berkeley, of course, we have these, you know, demands to complete proficiency materials. So we, we have to change the size of how small the thing is. But when I was on my own, because I wasn't in school, I could do the smallest amount and work on it all, all day. So I'll stop there. David, look at this. this is my room at Berkeley, right? <laughs> <laughs> with reflecting on what Kim said, you know, uh, uh, that we have dreams and we talk about the things that we want to achieve. Uh, unless we can execute them, they are only dreams, right? So I'm thinking that technique is only an avenue so that your voice can be heard through the instrument, no? your singing voice, right? And the instrument is just a means through, you know, to make to make your voice heard. But if the technique is in, in between, right? Then how can you sing freely? So you master your technique until it's no longer there, until it doesn't stop you anymore from singing. Um, and that's that's a thing that starts breathing, as you said, probably, you know, and making sure that every part of your body that is in contact with the instrument is relaxed, and uh, you are connected to your inner self, you no, know? so that when you play a note, that note is not only a note but is a vision of a note and a sound that you have here. You hear it inside you, you feel it inside you, and only then you play it. And you achieve that level of control in which the sound that you heard, that you felt, is the sound that you get. And I'm still working on that. <laughs> Hopefully one day. <laughs> I love that. Um, before I, so I'm going to turn some questions over to Ian and Cheryl, but I have one, just a fun one. Um, so a lot of the things you're talking about allow you to be adaptable. And I'm hoping you can share one story. Can you just give us one story from your performing career in which you had something totally unexpected happen? And you had to fall back on, you know, like what got you through, you know, like some crazy thing that happened. Is there anything that comes to mind? Something you weren't expecting? Some unexpected thing happened? Of course that happened to all of us just now from the pandemic, but um, but maybe something happened in a musical situation like at a concert or a gig. Oh boy. Well, I don't know. There's, there's always unprecedented things. Uh, before I answer that though, I just wanna say, Berta, thank you so much for your, the way you, the way you talk about the art, because that's, I have that, I identify with everything you've said. 
And that thing about the note, um, I took an idea from another artist about the idea that uh, they said a note doesn't live till you give it a face. So I try to think about giving a note a face, you know, they're, they're living things. And there's uh, more than one character maybe on the guitar, you know, or it could be a collection of uh, faces, but um, there's unprecedented things that happen uh, constantly. Okay. And I don't know, I don't know. There's, there's dramatic stories um, of technical things and mechanical things that take place. Um, I was at North Sea Jazz Festival and I was uh, an up and coming artist and I was there playing three concerts, which was kind of unprecedented. And the, the end of the concert set with my trio, which was very, very uh, successful. The uh, rented backline Fender Twin blew up at the crescendo of the final piece. And my beautiful trio, Stomo Takeshi and uh, Mike Sarin on drums. Stomo was with me. Stomo and I have been playing together for almost 40 years now. We were, we were together about 18 years at that point. As soon as that happened, I just glanced over my shoulder. You know, I'm playing like furiously and there's smoke coming up and there's no sound. And I glanced over my shoulder and I probably in a fraction of a second, I just thought, okay. And I looked at Stomo and I looked at, uh, at Mike and I put my index finger up and they came down to a whisper. And I walked up to the microphone that I used to speak and I just bent it down to my guitar and I finished the piece acoustically with electric guitar. You know, that could be a technical, you know, stay calm stay in the music. What kind of sound do you have on an um, unamplified electric guitar now? Is it an actual sound or did the amp do all the work, right? So yes, I developed the sound. So put the mic on there and I finished this piece. It sounded beautiful. You know, I mean, it, it functioned. One la other story real quick. This is a story about like, how aware am I that I'm learning more than one thing at a time? So you do lots and lots, I do lots and lots of gigs in the period, all kinds of different music. You learn stuff fast, you learn it by ear, you read it, whatever you do. I go into work on a film score. Robert Altman is in the control room, very famous filmmaker, and he has this movie score in which they had an original band playing original music so they could control the rights. And they didn't have any charts, and they said, we're going to play these tracks of the music in the film, and you're going to play along to them as if you're in the band. And they said, okay. And I said, sure. And they go, rolling, <laughs> you know. Okay, here we go. You know, so I just like playing along, listening to this track and playing, not following, but I'm making, you know, I'm making decisions uh, to be in the music as if when you play it back, it sounds like I was knew, knew the piece. And I did this, I think, pretty successfully, right? I'm hoping, right? We're always hoping, you know, I'm doing my best. And we get to the end and there's that, you know, pause where you see them talking. They come back, they say, that was great. We're going to give you a fresh track. Could you play that piece as a solo piece, please? Ready? Rolling. And it was like, okay, how did you learn all the stuff in the piece you just played to? Did you learn it all? Can you actually replicate this piece now with all the important form and movement and melodies and what's happening? And the answer was luckily, yes, I was able to do that because I can't tell you how many gigs I was on where you had to sort of do a version of that, like on the gig, right? Or a rehearsal that doesn't happen because something happened and now you're just walking out having to, you know. So those are unprecedented things and the training still all came down to super fundamental stuff. Can you recognize what chord sound that is? Do you, can you recognize a movement? Can you recognize the melody and memorize it? Thanks, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'll stop. Thanks. Berta, what about you? What came to your mind? Well, so many things came. Uh, one of one of them that that was a life changing experience actually was to play with Paquito Rivera, no? And I remember I, we had the the sponsorship ready to do a, a tour with uh, with an artist, right? That I wanted to invite as a as a duet partner to pay tribute to the music of Agustin Barrios Mangoré, 
who was famous for bring, uh, uh, bringing the, the classical and the popular world together in his music. So I thought that I wanted to have a partner that could bring those two worlds also to, to, to this duet, yeah, to honor his music. So I thought of Paquito de Rivera, why not? You can always dream, no? Right? But sure enough, I found a way to reach him. And so I called him and he said, I called him on Wednesday, I think. And he said, why don't you come on Fridays? Let's eat some beans and rice and beans together. So I went to see him in New York. And he wanted to listen to the music of Agustin Barrio. So I played for him. I played like for two hours, maybe, because he just kept asking me more pieces and more pieces. And then at the end, he was about to say yes, but there was one last thing that he wanted me to, to do before he said yes to committing to the tour. The tour, imagine, was going to be a 16 concert tour all throughout Latin America, the best halls in, in Latin America. So it's a huge thing. You know? So he was about to say yes. And then he said, that last piece you just played, <clears throat> can you just play the chords and accompany me so I can improvise? And I was able to do it because I, I played a, a little bit. Now I know that I play a little bit of popular music, you know. And, and so I, I was able to accompany him and he was able to improvise. And he said, that's an asset that not every classical guitarist has. So you are the partner for this, for this tour. I'm going to join you. Yeah. And that was because I was able to accompany him playing the short as a by Agustin Barrios, playing the chords, and he was able to improvise on top of that. And that single fact of being able to know your chords, know the rhythm, and being able to accompany him granted me my first Latin Grammy nomination, also, you know, because it happened with Paquito. So all of those things can be life-changing experience, you know, if you are ready when the, the time comes. I had a teacher who used to say, luck favors the prepared. <laughs> I always loved that. Um, Cheryl, what's on your mind for these two faculty members? Yeah, well, you know, one skill that um, oftentimes our entering guitarists are not the strongest in is reading music. And I know, um, you know, there are many reasons why. A lot of us start playing by ear. We, you know, a lot of folks now learn by video. So we don't really think about mapping the instrument that way and mastering the instrument that way. So I was just, I'd love to hear uh, from Berta and David, because I know Berta also teaches, has an ear training lab. And I, because I, you know, I also know many times when students come in, if they they feel nervous about their reading, because no one ever sat down with them and taught them how to read, and they, you know, um, especially if someone, you know, a lot of players come in and they can play, they can move around the instrument, and then to sit down and have to read means, oh, I have to start and be a beginner at something. So I was just curious about from both of you how you approach that with your students. Um, you know, particularly if, if, a, if a guitarist doesn't have a strong background in reading. Bercha, I'd like you to start. <laughs> yes, I think it's a, great, it's a great asset to have. Uh, then rehearsals become very short. You have your music in front of you, you play it a couple of times and then you can go and grab a beer, right, Kim? <laughs> <laughs> um, what we do in the side reading class is we basically learn the fretboard. We just spend time doing it. Mm. And I have every patience in the in the world just to, to do it. Because somebody was patient with me also to do it. And so note by note, fret by fret, we learn the, the basic uh, in the guitar. And then after the third lesson, kids are already reading. And my class, which um, has an emphasis on, on polyphonic writing, right? On, on multiple voices, not polyphonic, but multiple voices, sometimes can be scary. But when you see them reading um, 
classical pieces or uh, pieces, contemporary pieces written with classical technique, uh, such as the one that uh, Jim Kelly wrote for my class. Uh, and you see the kids enjoying so much. And you have this, they have this beautiful smile when they see that, that thing that was uh, so hard and distant becomes so easy. You know? It's like learning a language takes a lot of time as it does for me <laughs> with English. But eventually you can, you can deliver a joke in a new language. I think I'm gonna have to plead the fifth on this question. No, okay. Lies, no. I don't think so. I mean, because, you know, David, you and I teach some classes together. And yes. one thing that, and it ties in the classes we teach are writing and um, spontaneous composition based. And they tie in a little, in some ways to your studio skills class. And um, right. I think one thing that everyone is surprised about is the reading really comes into play and become when when someone says, you know, I want you to play a certain type of melody or here's the part. And if you can realize immediately what they've written, then you have time if you're in the studio to be creative with it in a different way. You know, and I think um, you have become excellent in your and not even I mean beyond that in the sense that you can take a piece of written music and because you feel comfortable reading the notes you can also see into them with the other fundamental skills you have if it's a melody then you see when you see a melody you see now all of the harmonic possibilities of the melody and all of the the ways that you could use that melody as as a way to build a piece of music, but in some ways it starts with understanding what's on the page. Um, yeah, that's very true. It's especially true in things like film mm -hmm. sessions or TV sessions, or mm -hmm. you know, most of the music is written. I mean, it's it's a little bit of a complicated thing for me because uh, just as background, coming up in New York in the '80s and '90s, I mean, I established myself there, of course, in the '80s, and I was not a reader. I was a real mm -hmm. base, you know, like. I could read only a small amount of data, um, but I was a real fast hearer and learner. Like people didn't realize I couldn't read. I, I was in the recording sessions all the time and they didn't realize I couldn't read. I was faking it. Um, I wouldn't advise that because first of all, number one, the world is way more literate now because of the computer and computer software and whatnot. So reading is now everywhere. It was not everywhere. It just wasn't. I mean, that tier that could write read, you know, the show players, the A-list studio people. Um, yeah, there was a lot of great work that they could do that I couldn't do. But everybody looked at me, all those guys and gals looked at me and said, why, you, why do you want to go down that road? You're already, you know, you have a sound. Go, go on, go, go away, go play. Anyways, later I realized, no, I have to get this skill together. So I did. I, I work on it all the time. One thing about reading that's interesting is if you do a moderate amount of it each day in a, in a level that's you know easy to do, slowly, but in time, you will not defeat yourself. And it can be really slow and really easy stuff. But if you do it every day, it reinforces in, in your mind and in your hands the relationship between the note on the page, the rhythm it is, where it is on the instrument, where you'd like to place it relative to where you have to be for the things that are coming, right, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I first of all, uh, geez, I'm gonna try to make this quick. Students have an issue with notes on the fretboard. They don't often have all the notes on the fretboard well commanded. But it's a little bit more than that. It has to do with what finger is on that note, which is why I love the modes, because you know, your finger is basically your eyes. So imagine your hand, you can't see the fretboard now. And if your middle finger or second finger is on an E on the second string at the fifth fret, now I'm oriented around that and I can find everything. But if I put my index finger there, those locations change. And I have to be sure about that. And then there's this idea, if we start to 
get somewhere with that and we're moving along and I, I want people not to defeat themselves, not to try to move too fast. Whenever I put a chart in front of a class, the first thing I say is don't look at this like it's music. Look at it like it's a drawing or a, a, a sign in a language you don't know. Let your eyes just go to all the things they go to. You'll see all the symmetries. You'll see all the things that are the same. You'll see the shapes and the spaces. You'll see where it gets busy. You'll see where it doesn't. Just let your eyes go there. You'll see the form if you really don't think about it like music. And when they do that, I say, as soon as I ask that question, I wait about five seconds, I say, how many people have felt their anxiety drop? And everyone goes like, mine, <laughs> this, is, this isn't as scary. And it's like, yeah, start like where you are. Like, just start with the fact that this is a language that we've translated sound into and we're gonna untranslate it. We don't live for the page. That's my opinion. Okay. See, you were going to plead the fifth there. No, <laughs> um, we have some questions from uh, people who are listening. Um, and so, Ian, I'm wondering before we get to those three questions, if if you have one that if you have a question on your mind that might have a a, a short answer from Berta and David. You know, I don't have a short question. I just <laughs> want to say that I really loved uh, what y'all are saying and um, especially loved like what Berto was saying about, you know, your inner voice and sort of materializing that and connecting that through also what David was saying about how there are, and Berto was talking about the fundamental elements, right? And that a lot of the things that, you know, we hear about you know, your voice and your sound and all these things are typically said in these sort of metaphysical terms. And yet there are very like actionable, real material things that you can work on to sort of give that note intention, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, yeah. And also, of course, read, read music because... <laughs> Ian, I love that you're here for that perspective because Ian is the most recent alum of, uh, from Berkeley in this webinar um, and is a great flat picker, great acoustic guitar player. Um, you can hear him every week on Coffee Talk. He plays all the opening music and composes it. Um, and so it's really good to hear um, your perspective and maybe you can share a few things when, when we get to the questions that are coming up now. Um, okay, so there's a few. Um, Oh, there's a, there's some great questions on here. Um, number one, I think um, people are, they have some feedback that they are excited to work on their reading. So if we've done one thing, um, I think that is great. And as a classical guitarist, I support that. And I know Cheryl does as a jazz player. So, um, and Ian, as a old time bluegrass player, you're reading tunes all the time as you're arranging them. So this is fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much um, for saying that. Um, Here's can one I, thing. Can oh, I just say one, one thing yeah. about that? The, the reading course. that you mentioned that there's people excited about reading. Yeah. I just want to add for anyone who's interested that if you sit when you practice or play with some music paper in front of you, some manuscript paper, and you take the, a moment to write something that you just played, just even if it's a, 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 a scale form but, or a melody you just played or a chord, write it out, figure out the rhythms, as you do this, they know now that if you hand write your music, your reading improves mm -hmm. and your ear training improves, even if you don't play it. Your brain knows what to do with what it sees. So writing and reading are tied. I think that's a great point. Um, here's one from Olivia, and this is going to be a tough one to keep short, but I hope that you can both keep it short. Um, she wants to know, um, did you ever have to deal with any criticism for choosing your path in music and how did you handle it? And David's laughing. Um, I'm telling, short, David. <laughs> okay, here's the shortest, here's the shortest way I can put it. Decades of rejection. Decades of rejection. Not a single record label ever wanted to record my music or sign it. Uh, I worked for the greatest promoters in the world, but they would not take me on in, in their stable of artists. They would say to my face, no. Um, uh, Mike Brecker brought 
Miles Davis's manager down to watch me play, and he said, "Look, this guy is, you know." And the guy said, "I don't think I don't think the world's ready for this," <laughs> which was a kind way of saying I don't like this. So, where do you get your fuel from? Because rejection is, is not fun. It's verifiably, it's a it's a drag. It's a weight. It can be very corrosive for your mind and soul. So it's not enough to like fight the good fight, right? The question is, why am I doing this? What gets me out of bed every day? And the first thing I can say about that is, you know, Kim, we always ask the students this question, who's your favorite guitar player? And if at any moment while you are alive playing this instrument, it's anybody but yourself, I really have to ask, what are you doing? Because there's no way you're gonna do this if it's somebody else. Like, I'm just gonna say this, it's a, it's a raw opinion, it's, it's probably not that favorable, but I never copied anybody, I never transcribed until way, way, way late. What I did was I stole concepts from people, but I didn't steal how they applied them. Um, I was always my favorite guitar player, I still get out of bed every day excited that I get to figure this out, that I get to work on music with people that I get to play with people, that I get to be on this panel with someone like Berta and Kim, and Cheryl and Ian and Damien, you know, like people who are like, you know, it's just amazing. But um, I just wanna say like, uh, it's real important that my motivation is impervious to criticism. Even though I listen to the criticism to see if it's needed. Because there were many times where my music wasn't developed well enough. I was trying to do something that was beyond my reach. And what they were saying was, it's not developed enough. The way they were saying it was not fun, but, you know. And sometimes the criticism was unwarranted, I think. Didn't matter. The motivation, every day I get out of bed, not because of any thing I'm winning out in the world. I get out of bed because I love the opportunity to work on this stuff. Berta, do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> I just remember when I was in, in Uruguay, I was a student, no? And I come from Paraguay, no? Paraguay and Uruguay, not the same. And uh, I was walking down the street to, to the school, no? And I was so happy because I was holding the uh, newspaper El País, which gave me a glowing review. They said that the best Uruguayan guitarist was a Paraguayan. The best, the best young guitarist was a Paraguayan. I was so happy. I was you know, with my newspaper and I find my teacher, Graciela Perez Quevaidis, on the way to school. And I just wanted to show her, so I show it to her. And she said, listen, a review, if it's good or bad, shouldn't alter your path. You are the musician you are, no matter what. So I folded my newspaper, put it under my <laughs> continue to school. I'll never forget that. Yeah, my, my parents, uh, my father in particular, loved the press that I would get when I would get a favorable press. I got lots of favorable press, like extremely favorable, uh, but press doesn't actually convert necessarily into anything other than uh, you could pack a box with the papers. <laughs> That's great. I mean, I think that, you know, as you go to, like David, you're saying there's constructive criticism that you receive from your teachers, right? And your peers and, you know, the people you're learning with and from and, and then there's just sometimes criticism that means a lot more about the person who's giving it than it means about you. And so it's a it's a balance of things. I think that's a good question. Um, Giuseppe has a question. Um, he said um, he's a young musician from Washington and wants to know how much music theory he needs to know. And he was told he has a decent grounding and he needs a decent grounding in music theory if he's going to progress. And I, I think I just want to say quickly that I think that's true. I think that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the fundamentals of 
music and um, everything that everyone talked about in the beginning. And um, I'd like to quote David for a second and um, and say that there isn't music theory because it's music theory is music fact. And that's what will help you. <laughs> you know, the scales and the chords and the way things are built, um, you'll see are, it's much more tangible than theory. And so if you can think of it, be curious about the building blocks, I think that's one good way to start. Um, do, you, do either of you want to jump in and add anything that you haven't already said about some of those fundamentals? You think? Well, I, I would just like to say that it is not music theory. That is, uh, as we know, it used to be called the theory of common practice. Kim always lets students know that's what it was called. It got shortened to this idea of theory. Um, this isn't quantum physics. I mean, it is, but it isn't, you know, like in a strict sense, uh, there's nothing theoretical. And the problem with thinking that it's theoretical is that you have this idea that anything you're doing on your instrument relates to this, you know, cloud of music theory concept. And it's like, no, everything you do on your instrument is music fact. Everything that's in that category that you call music theory is either here or it's not, but it needs to be here because we build music out of these things. There, it's like, it's like you call a pile of bricks, a theoretical pile of bricks. No, of course not. That's what the stuff on the list of music theory is. We're going to actually build a house. You know, your music is your house. So it's not theoretical. <laughs> <laughs> Can I jump in here? There's one aspect of this question that is about whether or not it's harder as an older student to acquire a lot of the same skills and also then connecting it. How much, you know, theory do you need to know? And I just want to jump in here as somebody who didn't start on the guitar. I was a bass player. I did upright bass until I was like probably 20. And then I got my first guitar at 20. So I was a lot older and I came to Berkeley as an older student. And I got to say that actually, like, I think it is harder as you get older to acquire things as fast as you do when you're a kid. But knowing the fundamentals, knowing the note names, knowing the intellectual side, the information side of music makes it a lot easier to learn things and a lot easier to progress on the instrument. So if you are an older student, the more you know about fundamental music stuff will make it a lot easier essentially to catch up. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe there's this problem also, I notice students refer to this idea of thinking and feeling are two different things. Like they say, should I be thinking while I'm playing? And it's like, um, if you're alive, you're <laughs> thinking. Okay, so if you're breathing, you're thinking, and you're feeling. They're not separate. And they never will be. Like that does not exist. So the idea of like, you know, when I'm, I'm, I'm in a situation, uh, you know, any kind of music situation, I'm thinking about what's, I'm analyzing, I'm also feeling, I'm, making decisions that are intuitive, they're impulsive, they're also planned or thought through. I don't care how much of that is whatever it is, but the idea that there's this feeling space you're gonna be in with music is just a trick you're telling yourself. I don't know, you know. When you didn't see Jimi Hendrix on stage, he was in his motel room practicing like a madman. And people think that's not true. He was a reader. He was a sight reader. So was Jimmy Page, by the way, just saying. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And we know like when people come through, when Jimmy Page came through, all he wanted to talk about with me was how do I fix my A finger, Berta? How do I bring out melodies better with my A finger? Like, why did I stop taking classical lessons? You know, like he, he was at, he was taking lessons at the reception, you know? So everybody's learning, I think is a good thing to remember. And so whenever you start, you start and then you go. Um, Cheryl, here's one for you. Um, what, how do you approach learning a new jazz tune? And what advice do you have for young students who maybe just got into jazz? I, my first advice is listen to a lot of jazz. Because um, you can't play something you've never heard before or in a style that you've never heard. But I mean, just let your heart open up to it and listen to it and then you'll love it. So it's not, I think some people think, oh, this is a complicated and complex, but it, it's very 
tune based, you know, if it's standard tunes, um, that's the first place is listen to the tune. If, if you're going to learn a tune, I, I, I try to listen to as many versions of it as I can. And um, if it's a jazz tune, like if it was a Thelonious Monk tune, I'd like to hear Monk play it or, you know, whoever that is. Or if it's a standard, there's probably hundreds of versions of it. Like a lot of the tunes, like all the things you are, um, like someone in love or any, you know, in these tunes, I, I would just make a big long playlist and just take the song in as a song and get into the expression of the song. And then you can dig in and get a little scientific with it later. But I think just try to connect with the song and the feeling of the song, how it makes you feel, where it comes from, all that stuff. It's more organic than, than uh, some folks would like it to be. <laughs> Berta, how does someone begin working on sight reading? I would say that uh, work on first position. Okay. You know, work on first position, include your open strings. That will get you going through a lot of repertoire already. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it might not be that complicated. All mm -hmm. you need is to choose the right ones. So you will get your confidence built also, you know? And if you can find also pieces that will work on your technique gradually at the same time that it builds your uh, abilities to read, that's a perfect combination. That's great. So, so this is a great question about auditions. And, you know, Damien, maybe this is a good time to put you on the spot and say that we'd like to do a coffee talk with some of our um, audition and interview um, faculty and and really deeply get into this um, idea. And so we will keep you all updated. If you follow us on Instagram, we'll let you know when we're going to do it. And we'll do a whole hour on on audition preparation. Um, Cheryl and Ian, I'm, in, I'm volunteering you as well. And perhaps um, David and Berta, uh, you know, uh, but what I want to say about that is what you have to do first is you're going to come in and play a prepared piece of music that you love that really shows us that you're comfortable with your technique, that you can play expressively, and that you can um, really show us, you know, what you want to show us about how much you love music and, and what you love about your playing in five minutes. So, you know, it's just going to be, don't try to say like, oh, I heard that everyone has to play a jazz tune, or I'm going to play this thing that's beyond me technically because I think it's impressive. We can see and here into your musicianship. So we just want you to be you. Then what's gonna happen is um, we're gonna ask you to sight read a little bit and you're gonna get the reading ahead of time so you can take a look at it before your audition. Um, but we will have some resources we'll put on our YouTube so you can um, look ahead a little bit to the auditions. We're starting that. Um, we also have some backing tracks because we're gonna ask you to improvise in the audition and you can tell us the style that you're comfortable with and um, on our YouTube um, for the guitar department, we have a collection of things that faculty made. So you could practice ahead of time if you want to for that part of the audition. And then we have some fun. We do some ear training games that might sound terrifying to you right now as I'm describing them, but they're really fun. They're clapping back rhythms. And we just want to see, like, can you get into something and work with us and have a good time? It's about 20 minutes. And actually, I know you won't believe me when I say this, but it's really fun. Um, other auditions at other schools may not be fun, but this one is actually really fun. Um, so, and then you get to go talk with Damien and, um, or one of his staff members about your aspirations and what you want to major in, and you can bring your songs and your compositions and things like that, that will help like give us a, a balanced look at your whole body of work. If that's more your strength than you feel like you're playing is. So um, we just want to know you. And we want to make sure you're in the right place at the right time. And so I think that's maybe what makes our audition process a little bit different. Um, what do you think about that, Damien? Do you think that's? Well, thanks for mentioning how much fun our audition process is. I mean, I think, you know, most students who've auditioned with Berkeley come out of the room smiling mm -hmm. and talking about how much they enjoyed, you know, because we're not into the intimidation factor at Berkeley. We just want to get to know you as a musician and we want to play with you and and see what you do you know and we're thinking in admissions we're thinking about 
what will this student bring to Berkeley that's going to make it an even better experience for everyone, you know? So bring you. That's what we want to hear and see and who we want to get to know. Mm. Um, yeah, I think that's great. Um, David, do you have maybe 30 seconds? Like, what's the first thing you want to do if you're afraid to improvise and you want to start, like, right now? What would you do in, in just a quickie? I would just take anything that you like playing, you know what I mean? It could be a pattern of chords or it could be just some notes or it could be a scale or anything, any, anything you do, the, like the first thing you do when you pick up the guitar, but just let yourself work with it in a way, like let yourself just sort of flow with it in a way where as you work with it, you make some tiny changes and kind of go out and come back. Just start there, like without thinking about what is it becoming or what is it what is it called or how does it relate? Just have the experience of leaving your comfort zone, coming back. Just leave your comfort zone, come back. If you don't go down so much, go down. You know, if you don't leap, leap a little bit. It's really important to push your hands before you hear. Don't worry about hearing first. It's the I think that's the worst advice possible. That's later, that's a later thing. Just push your hands here after, you're teaching yourself how to hear. But just a uh, little tiny, you know, uh, things. Molly Tuttle and I worked together. We worked on one string with three notes and then we changed one of the notes. And she just went like, yeah, that's so great, you know? And she put it right in her music. It was beautiful. Um, I'm glad that you said that, David, um, about Molly because um, we really feel like when you come here, we get to know you and you stay a part of our big Berkeley guitar community after you leave. And um, David, there's another one of your students in the chat. I don't know if you've seen that, one of your former students. I see it, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> which is so great. Hi, <laughs> we love seeing it. We, in fact, just hired two alumni who studied with David on our faculty this semester. So we're thrilled about that. Um, the last question that's in there is about you know when you fell in love with the guitar and for that i'm going to direct all of you to listen to david and berta on our podcast called coffee talk you can find it on apple Podcasts and spotify just go berkeley guitar department coffee talk it'll pop up and you'll find them and um you can get um some a lot of insight and story that we don't have time to get into that was really great so i think we've actually hit everyone's questions in the one minute we have left. Um, Damien, I'm going to hand it back to you. Um, and thank you all so much for for hanging. And um, thanks to everyone who's hanging with us listening um, in our first stylistic diversity webinar series. So very cool, Kim. This, this was such a great uh, conversation. And um, everyone should know that this is the first of three sessions that the guitar department will be running this term. So watch our on our admissions website, you'll see all of the events listed, both virtual events as well as in-person events. And yes, we are indeed doing both this year. My staff are already out on the road visiting um, across the country and internationally. We're getting ready to visit Seoul, Korea in just a few weeks. And so we're really excited to meet all of you as we travel the world to find the greatest musicians that we can find and bring them to Berkeley. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks.